What's up everybody, Alex here, and welcome to the Dota Underlords Best Builds of the Week, the weekly series where I show you guys top 5 meta builds to help you rank up in Dota Underlords. Now this week we are starting with Knights and Healers. Guys, this build has seen some very significant buffs over the last couple weeks, especially considering you have the Dazzle buff, which now allows him at 3 stars to create the Vesture of the Tyrant effect, so everyone within one cell of him uh, will survive. You can even adjust your uh, positioning. Take advantage of which, because it's going to be within one cell. Uh, you also have the buff to Omni Knight, so now uh, his uh, Purification will do 2 cells worth of damage at 3 stars around uh, and, uh, with, against enemy units, which will create a massive amount of AoE damage uh, dealing capability. Uh, you also have the Bad Rider as well, who has 3 star capabilities of, uh, you know, be able to burn and whatnot. With the nerfs to Brawny, that's a little less significant, but still some added bonus. And if you do get Chaos Knight to 3 stars, you actually are able to move your uh, knights however you wish and still maintain the knight bonus. Uh, realistically, I don't. I think this is the most underwhelming of the uh, the, the 3 star effects. Uh, of course, it is beneficial uh, in, in many ways, but, uh, you know, when you consider what the, uh, the Vesture of the Tyrant effect on Dazzle does, and the AoE damage capabilities of Omni Knight, does being blocked off for uh, for knights is not too much of an issue um, especially in uh, the current meta it certainly has its value but uh, there are ways that you can kind of uh you know, move around if you're against spirits or anything along those lines. A 3 star CK still provides flexibility, don't get me wrong, but uh, he doesn't have the outright game breaking potential that some of these other 3, three star impacts do. Now, one thing I will note is that Luna uh, at 2 stars, you run the Mask of Madness. Do not make the mistake of getting Luna to 3 stars and keeping the Mask of Madness on her. At 3 stars, she's going to be casting Eclipse. In fact, I would recommend that you put Luna on the front line if you have that ability. If she has Eclipse, you're not going to want to have a uh, Mask of Madness on her because it's going to not allow her to cast for three star ability and uh you know you want her up front so that you can hit within two cells range if you have a blink dagger luna is a fantastic unit at three stars with a blink dagger you'll jump right into the enemy line and within two cells you are absolutely going to decimate everybody now there is a variant of this build as well that takes advantage of jewel you're looking at something like this uh jewel you'll have in the center here this is of course a happy hour jewel the reason for that is because with happy hour you're basically going to slow down the amount of uh, kind of incoming damage that your team uh, is going to be sustaining which will allow your healers and your warlocks to basically heal yourself all the way back up. Uh, the benefit to this, though, is that uh, you're going to have Joel in the center here because he does get additional armor based on surrounding units. You want to be centered up here, which is a little vulnerable to spirits, I understand. However, with Joel, you want to make sure you maximize his armor. Uh, you also want to make sure that your knights are positioned in a way so that you have a ranged knight uh, and uh, the two melee knights beside each other so that you're maintaining the knight bonus. They don't have to be, the, the two separate banks of knights don't have to be connected together to get the knight bonus. They just need to be within one cell of another knight. And uh, that's how you accomplish that there. And of course, if you have the three star CK, then you can position them however you want. It won't even matter. But this is a build that with the uh, the buff to Omni Knight and the changes that have been made to Dazzle, for instance, like the positioning on Dazzle here is, is perfect. To take advantage of the vesture of the tyrant um but anyways guys a fantastic build and let's move on to build number two all right and for build number two we've got assassins voids and spirits and this build has been one that i've been preaching for so damn long it's been one that i've been telling you guys that it is fantastic and it is and people still do not go assassins in games and it blows my mind spirits have been recently reduced slightly uh, with their effectiveness but still you know the disarm and the silence effects are still worth it spirit isn't doing as much damage as it did before but you're still getting a lot of value from uh, running these spirits here i don't recommend stacking multiple storm spirits in order to just delta slam like crazy the damage has been reduced enough that you know you need to rely on the damage from your assassins in order to really get things done you are going six assassins here uh, there are key a couple key things you need to remember in this build you do have the uh, spike carapace of nyx assassin that's going to be disabling you have the earth spirit who has a three star effect that that can stun as well as silence enemies with his uh, geomagnetic grip you have the uh um sorry you have uh, faceless void which will chrono cube which really locks down opposing units so the result of this is that you have many crowd control style abilities including that of eno all that attack eno is wonderful in this build because you basically stun them you have stuns here you have stuns here you have lockdown here and it's ridiculous. Uh, there's a few mandatory items that you need to be aware of because of the way that uh, you want to get that early Delta Slam, you want to get that early Silence off. You're going to want a uh, an Ember Spirit with a Blink Dagger. I know that some people like to do like Blade Furies and stuff like that, but in order to get that really early Delta Slam, Blink Dagger is one that I've been running uh, very often with Ember Spirit. It reduces his damage output, but you're going to make that up in your uh, ability to Delta Slam more reliably. Uh, you're also looking for a Mask of Madness on Slark, an absolutely mandatory item in any build where you run a Slark. There is literally no item better 
for Slark, the Mask of Madness. It changes him from a unit that'll probably just die in your back line to, uh, to the enemy's back line, sorry, to one that could absolutely carry you to a win. So uh, Mask of Madness, absolutely mandatory on Slark. And outside of that, an overall extremely balanced build. Brawnies have been nerfed, so the benefit of Void is slightly reduced, but still, it's good on all builds. It's good on all builds. It's good against Knights. It's good against other Assassins. It doesn't matter. Voids, it, it, it's not discriminatory. It does not care who it's taking the percentage damage off of. Um, it just happens that against Brawnies, it took more damage off, but still a very effective alliance. And let's move on to build number three. And for the third build of the week, we're looking at Heartless Trolls, and this is a build that has been uh, climbing through the meta in the last few weeks. And what you're looking at here is you're looking at the new 3-star effect of Pudge. Pudge is going to be getting a extra 500 hit points at uh, level 3, as well as a 10% uh, magic resistance bonus per enemy unit that dies in his vicinity. That is absolutely fantastic. If you can get something like a Chain or Blade Mail on him, uh, he becomes an absolute monster. 30% uh, uh, damage reflected back to the attacker over 7k health. Not even That's just ignoring the additional 5 armor and the effective HP he's gaining from that. He's a beast. An absolute beast. Uh, I do recommend you run Disruptor in this build. Not only does it give you a Warlock bonus here, but his ability to silence and lock down enemy spellcasters in a meta. That is, you're seeing a lot of mages, uh, you know, and uh, spirits and stuff like that. It's fantastic. Truly remarkable. Um, and again, Warlock. You might be thinking, Alex, why run three Warlocks? Why not, why not run a fourth? Well, the nice thing about Warlocks is that that third Warlock still has a pretty big impact on your board because it's another Warlock ca casting an ability which will provide and uh, activate the Warlock bonus. So it's one of the few alliances that despite not getting to like your full, you know, fourth warlock, having just a third does benefit. You're going to get additional healing from that third warlock because you're going to be linking an additional unit. So uh, it's a still a pretty good bet there. Uh, and Necrophos, of course, will activate your four heartless. Uh, now, the, the dream is Troll Warlord. And ideally, if you're talking about pure alliances, you're going to be taking out the Shadow Shaman for Troll Warlord. And you're going to position him accordingly, of course, depending on what's going on. If you don't have a three-star Dazzle and you're not worrying about that Fester effect, I'd recommend you put him in a position where he can do the most damage as he can uh, but if you have a three-star shadow shaman obviously you do not take that take out the three-star shadow shaman you'll take out a dazzle or a witch doctor who whoever it might be uh, so dazzles so sorry troll warlords coming in for your weakest troll ideally all things being equal it's shadow shaman that does come out in this situation but overall this is a very good build one that balances you know the uh, the, the troll attack speed the heartless uh, effect of you know physical damage being done and uh, the healing impact of uh, warlocks and uh, healers it is extremely well balanced for this build I do recommend uh, damage support in Essex you want that enthrall bonus you're looking at a lot of ranged units and the trolls can do a tremendous amount of uh, damage so I do recommend enthrall in this build and for the fourth build of the week I've got something totally new and special for you this is voids hunters and assassins this is one that I've been having a ton of fun with in my testing. It has been absolutely remarkable. Remarkable. Now, it's a bit of a reach in some ways because you have a couple units here which are tier 5s. And I don't like relying on tier 5 units. You know, you do have some options. Instead of Medusa, obviously you have Terror Blade. And instead of the Faceless Void in the, in the interim, you have Void Spirit. Although you do lose, well, you know, he'll have the, the hat on him. You will lose your Assassin, right? So you do want to get Faceless as soon as you can. So these are the, the subs you'd want to do. And actually, you'd position more like this. But what you do is if you get uh, Medusa, you take Terror Blade out. Medusa comes in. If you get the uh, the faceless, you get void out, and you put the faceless in. Faceless getting the cap. You're looking for the antlers here. This build does not work. It does work. You'd have to get to ten, but I don't like relying on getting to ten. Uh, you know, I like I like designing builds based on uh, level nine. And what you're getting here is you're getting six hunters. You're getting a ton of DPS. You're getting the full vigilant effect. There are a few key things you really want here. You do want Desolator on your uh, Drow Ranger. It really amplifies the damage capability of your team. You do want uh, uh, damage in Essex here, in Essex here because uh, Enthrall in the dar uh, the armor reduction does help to burst down enemy units. Because in this variant of this build, you're not running Heartless, right? You're running no Heartless. So the added uh, armor reduction of Enthrall does help. Uh, you're putting Weaver here because he. He's going to step forward, and then the archer is going to spawn here, and that's going to protect the Nessex, uh, which is key. And, uh, you know, Faceless Void has a very good attack speed and a lot of damage potential, so the uh, the Crown of Antlers is a pretty good bet on him. Uh, you could put it on someone like uh, Templar Assassin as well. The problem is her attack speed is uh, significantly lower than that of Faceless Voids, and it works well on uh, Void Spirit because of his uh, quick attack speed as well. Overall, a very good build. Brawnies have been nerfed, so the Void Impact is not as significant as, as it was, but what you're looking at here is you're looking at a very significant 
significant uh, damage dealing build. The only issue is, is that you are running a little light on the front line. You're running Enigma to kind of, you're trying to like just blow them up before they can blow you up. You're getting the initial stun from Spike Carapace, so I do recommend you look for like a chainmail for the, the next assassin to give him that added survivability to ensure that he gets the Spike Carapace off so he can disable and stun. And then hopefully by that time, Medusa will be able to uh, to stone form everyone in the front line there. Uh, a great build and one that is a ton of fun to play. And for the final build of the week, you've got Druids, Savages, and Summoners. This has been a build that I've been having a ton of fun with, and uh, you also get the added benefit of running Scaled in this build here, because I do like running the Ven the Venomancer here and the Tide Hunter on the front line. The reason for the Tide Front Hunter here is just to allow your team to get that extra breathing room with um, you know uh, with that Ravage. Now I have a Chainmail on him now, but realistically, if you can get a Refresher Orb on him, it's absolutely fantastic. Actually, I'm missing Refresher Orbs here. I should have Refresher Orbs out. So there's two potential heroes that could really benefit. I need another one give me another one there's two heroes that really benefit from refresh orb so if you get one you can put it on tide hunter for the double ravage put this on someone like uh, treant or even on uh, the bristleback bristleback of course benefits from vanguard early in the game uh, but if you get a second refresh orb of course you want to put it on the lone druid because the two spirit bears are absolutely ridiculous um, the nice thing about this build here is that uh, you know you have a lot of ability to do a ton of damage if you get the 10 if you have a crystal maiden she really benefits this as well you're going to be adding additional uh, mana generation and also if you get her to three stars early uh, you get the uh, reduction in cooldown which benefits of, of course venomancer and uh, people like uh, nature's prophet and all these summoners really benefit from the reduction in uh, in um, in cooldowns, especially Bristleback, he'll basically lead you in damage. Um, but uh, Maiden's not absolutely necessary, but the reason why I have her here is because if you look at the board here, you're looking at Magnus, you're looking at Venomancer, you're looking at uh, Crystal Maiden, and you're looking at Nature's Prophet, all are relatively, and sorry, Bristleback, of course, they're all, uh, you know, one and tier two units. The result of that is you're going to be doing some early rolling, so it's very possible that if mages aren't necessarily contested, you might actually pull off a three-star Crystal Maiden in this build. So it's worth considering because she does really uh, positively impact the board. If you can get her to three stars, if she's two stars, sell her off. It's not really worth it. Get a next best available in here. But, uh, you know, this build's absolutely fantastic. You want to go uh, healing support in Essex because the, her summons will benefit from the Savage and the Summoner bonus. Uh, that golem will be an absolute train wrecking machine and will help you carry yourself to the win. And, guys, thank you so much for watching. And a very special thank you to all of my wonderful subscribers. Take care, everyone, and have yourselves an absolutely wonderful day.